Jock Finlayson, you are an economist, and you are an economist who has a high profile. You're out uh, sharing insights into the economy of British Columbia and, to a larger extent, Canada. Um, what exactly does your job look like? When you go to work on a day-to-day -day basis, what do you do? Well, I'm only half time now, so okay. I don't do oh. as much as I, <laughs> I used to do. It's kind of my phase retirement. But when I was doing it full time, uh, we uh, work with a small team of three or four other people. And the first thing we do is look at whatever the economic data is that's being generated, not just about BC or Canada, but you know, commodity markets, what's happening in the US, what's happening in the financial markets, because all of that obviously shapes our analysis and kind of advocacy in the BC and the Canadian context. So you can't, it's kind of hard to do work on Canadian economic policy or BC economic policy if you're not paying attention to, to what's happening in the wider world. So we do spend a lot of time absorbing and trying to understand and reading commentaries on what's actually happening out in the, out in the marketplace. That's pretty important. The second thing we do is we are, or what I spend a lot of time on is consuming the reports and analysis of think tanks, investment banks, uh, independent academic economists, those who write on sort of contemporary affairs, because those people are all smarter than we are generally, and they're working every day on doing the particular job they have. And we find that a lot of that work done by the C.D. Howe Institute, the Brookings Institution, the uh, Fraser Institute, uh, the American Enterprise Institute, and all kinds of others uh, is very helpful in, in, the, in the work we do, especially when they're writing on public policy issues, which is sort of the stock and trade of what we spend our time on. So we spend a fair amount of time looking at data and looking at research and reports produced by other organizations. Do you have to be selective about which of these think tanks? Because there are quite a wide range <laughs> and different yeah. perspectives. So do you have to, at some point, go through the analysis of saying, well, the information that this organization is providing has credibility and here's why? Yeah, I think I mean, you have to worry a bit about that because you can get into sort of a confirmation bias loop that you like the reports produced by X and so you spend a lot of time reading them and you don't spend time looking at other stuff. So I, I try and guard against that a, a little bit. I, I'm i a kind of a center right person mm -hmm. politically, but I do spend time in Canada. I look at stuff being produced by the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives uh, and by some uh, economists uh, working in academia who I don't necessarily would agree with all their political positions, but whose work I respect, yeah. uh, because I think it's you know it's important to expose yourself to that. So, but yes, you have to be have to be incredibly <laughs> selective, especially in in our shop at the Business Council of BC. We cover the whole economy, right? So we're not just if you're working for the mining industry or the tourism industry, you can look just at the stuff that's most germane right. to the sector. Uh, our our sector is the entire three hundred billion dollar BC economy. So we, we we you know there's a lot of a lot of stuff we could learn uh, that would touch on that. So we do have to be highly selective. So you also I I imagine have to spend a considerable amount of time putting together your own reports. So writing must be a yeah. big part of your job. Writing and mm -hmm. editing. I mean I've got a team or a, I, 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 they don't report to me any longer, but they did for for a couple of decades. So yeah, we have a, a team of people that work kind of collaboratively. A lot of our stuff is co-authored. And we do, you know, newspaper columns, uh, blog posts, just like everybody else, LinkedIn posts, um, uh, budget submissions, um, uh, commentaries on things that are relevant to the business community here, reports to our own members, analytical papers, one of my colleagues, David Williams, who's been on Conversations That Matter, he published a peer-reviewed academic article a couple of years ago that linked looked at productivity in relation to real wages and asked, is there kind of a connection? The good news is there is quite a tight connection. So we produce a lot of different kinds of, of output. Occasionally, we ask ourselves, who's reading it? <laughs> and, and, and kind of uh, try and convince ourselves that it matters that, that we're doing it. But uh, yeah, we, we produce a lot of written output and I I have a big role in that and, and also in the editing of what, what, what my colleagues produce. Oh, well, that leads to what I think must be another element of your job is that you gotta get out there and communicate this. And so you must do that in a wide variety of ways. How, how do you get yeah. that message out? Well, I mean, <clears throat> we, uh, uh, we do a lot of presentations uh, like 
I think you've seen some of the PowerPoint. I'm like a special needs child. I need PowerPoint to stand up in front of an audience. Without it, I'm you know completely ineffective. So we do a lot of economic related uh, presentations to to government audiences, to business audiences, uh, anybody who will really hear from us. We're, we're we're prepared to do that. So we do between myself and my colleagues, we would do well, we do over 100 of those a year, probably. Um, <clears throat> so that's one. Um, and th those are often, those are typically private. No, there's no media present. Right? Mm. Be a, a company meeting or a, you know, a private, uh, a Surrey Board of Trade or whatever, whatever the case may be. A meeting of government officials, government caucuses, and so on. Then we do uh, uh, external communication. So that's your business. So that's basically both earned media uh, but also we put our own material out in, 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 in the form of newspaper columns in particular. One of the challenges we've got is the newspaper industry is struggling, uh, and that's a polite word for it. And so the, the, the mechanisms we use to communicate our stuff into the wider world are kind of shifting. So we've had to, we've had to go to the social media. Uh, I'm, I'm not personally, I don't, I don't tweet. Um, uh, and in fact, my colleagues don't tweet either, but some of them are on Facebook and Instagram. We're all on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And the organization uh, that we work for has its own LinkedIn account, obviously, and tweets and Facebooks and all the rest of it. So I think we're struggling to be candid still to right. make the transition from traditional kind of print and broadcast media into this social media world. And it's, it's not easy. It's a noisy and crowded space, as you know. So it's an interesting and complex job that requires a uh, wealth of knowledge and experience. Uh, I'm sure that when you went to university, you didn't envision the job that you have now. No. What, what was it that you entered university to study? Well, I, I, uh, my main goal was I grew up in a small town and my family was in, a, in, in the retail furniture business and that wasn't what I wanted to do. Uh, so my part of my goal of going to university was to m make sure I didn't <laughs> end up falling in that in that trajectory. And then I liked uh, economics and political science and and disciplines like that when I was in school. Uh, and uh, but I had no I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't have any kind of grand plan. I went to grad school. And then in the 1981-82 recession, which you may remember, was yeah. a doozer. Um, I decided to get out. I decided to leave uh, grad school and see if I, I was at Queen's University at the time. And I started nosing around to see if I could get a job doing some kind of public policy stuff because that's what I was interested in. And uh, uh, ended up, lo and behold, despite the bad economy, I just was kind of lucky. I managed to have a couple of offers. And so I, I took advantage of that. I ended up moving to Ottawa, working for a business uh, organization. And I sort of and I like, I like the interface between uh, business and the state, if you will. Uh, I, I just find that kind of intellectually fascinating. So that's really what I've spent most of my career working on. So, uh, and I, I gravitated more yeah. to economics and away from what I would call kind of policy analysis over, over time. But I started off not really working as an economist, more as a policy kind of analyst. Wow. And then I picked up the economics. Of, uh, I had some in, in school, but I picked more of it up later. How long were you there? I was in Ottawa for uh, uh, four years. Then I went to grad school in the U.S. for two, and then I came to back. To study what? What were you? A business. Uh -huh. I went to okay. business school, but I, I did a lot of economics courses. And then I came back and worked in the same, I worked in the consulting business for a while, then I went back into the industry association world. And that's how I got offered a job out in Vancouver. Uh, my wife and I are both from BC. We never had the slightest expectation that we would return to BC. Uh, my wife was educated in Toronto and she was working in Toronto for a period of time. But suddenly this job offer materialized to return to BC. So we- The one we, that you're yeah, about yeah, to exit now. Yeah, and, and we fl I'll never forget, we flew out on a Canadian Airlines flight, no longer no with us. No longer with us, yeah. Um, on, in January, early January in 1994, and we flew out of a horrific snowstorm in Toronto and landed into sunshine at 12 degrees Celsius in Vancouver. And as we were getting the bags, my wife said, I hope you like this offer, because this is where we want to come. And so that's kind of where, where it started. And your progression through 
BCBC, which is the organization that you've been with, what position did you start in? And then how has that changed yeah. over time it's, as it's you know, a the small landscape shop. changes? Yeah. Uh, so the, I, I, when I joined, there was no, they didn't have a, I was sort of like the in charge of the policy shop. It was just me. Um, and over time, we, we added more, more people to work on more on economic issues. We have somebody who works on environment. I mean, that's become a big part of what we do. Environmental policy, energy policy. Uh, we've had people work on labor issues, labor legislation. Um, we have more people working on economics. So we've built up, it's still a very small shop, but uh, I was able to kind of build a team of three or four professionals incrementally over quite a long period. It's not a, it's not a big, it's not a big uh, organization. And uh, yeah, but I think we, we feel we did, we've done high quality work. And uh, the other thing is in our organization, you get to meet the business leaders who are running these companies in all the different sectors of the economy. So that, that's a real, which most sort of academic people don't get that right. experience if you're in the ivory tower world. We've had the opportunity to uh, kind of see the world through the lens of actual businesses that are trying to grow and survive and you know, build customer base and retain customers and, and uh, hire and you know, innovate and adopt technology and build new markets. So it's, it's really been a, a very insightful to, to, to see how all these companies are adapting and responding. And that obviously informs the, the work we do. We are trying to influence government policy, that's our stock and trade. But we do that in part through research, but also partly through just trying to understand what these companies operating in BC need uh, from, from government or would like, would like to see governments do to create a, a healthy environment. We don't help companies lobby the government for money or for particular uh, you know, incentive programs. Or now you're strictly on the policy side. Yes, we don't do a lot of what I would call company specific advocacy. So if a particular <laughs> firm wants to access R&D tax credits or, or sell to the government in terms of procurement, we're not, we're not really involved in, in, mm -hmm. in, in, that, in that activity. Uh, so we, we try and stay back from that and look at the, the business environment broadly in, yeah. in the province and how that, is it good, is it not good, how could we make it better? What can we learn from other jurisdictions that might be performing better than us? Uh, what do we learn from our own historical mistakes as a jurisdiction? That's that's a big question, and uh, we try and bring all that together to inform the analysis and advocacy that we do. Which you know, I think we do a decent job at it. It's not it's not perfect, but we we make we we get by. If I can put it that way. So let's say there's a young person watching this interview right now, and they go, "I want to be like you." <laughs> really? uh, yeah. What personality characteristic? you think is been most important in helping you move forward in your career? Yeah, I would say, well, for the work I do, I have a very strong intellectual interest in, in, the, in, the, in the topics uh, and, and the information we spend all our time on. So that's peculiar. Most people wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have that. So it's your, your average person isn't, even, even your average person with a, a couple of university degrees may not, that may not be what motivates them. So. Uh, I have not been motivated by money in the sense that I haven't, you know, explicitly sought to, you know, become wealthy as such. In, in that regard, I've succeeded. <laughs> but uh, uh, but I congratulations. You know, obviously, yes. obviously, you know, money money is important. But it hasn't been my. If you, if you're motivated uh, to accumulate wealth, then the kind of work I'm doing is not is not where you want to go. You're better off to be an entrepreneur or investment banker or. A, a tax lawyer or something like that. So, uh, so it's it's been and and we attract in, in into the organization and other similar organizations. You attract people who tend to be very similar in that in that regard. So, curiosity. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you know, learning. Uh, well, one thing about our shop is it's provided a great platform for continuing to learn new new things and yeah. deepen your understanding. The risk we face is, and I think a lot of, especially in the social media age, is doubling down on what you already believe uh, and just doing that every single day and not paying attention to conflicting information or voices that may not agree with your, what we call in economics, your priors, your, your kind of existing beliefs. So I think it's quite a struggle to uh, find the time to expose yourself to writers and thinkers and researchers who 
maybe come at things from a different angle. So I, I do try and dedicate you know, a few hours a week to doing that. Sometimes I, I fail, but we, I, I know the people I go to, certain academics, think tanks that, uh, uh, you know, they, it's, it's useful to see how they see the world, even if it doesn't align with your, your perspective. So, Well, I appreciate the work you do, and thanks for giving us a little bit of an insight into your career and your day-to-day -day job. Thank you.